This week on the All-American Legacy Podcast. You know, when we think about our bloodline and our great legacy, there is so much focus on World War II and perhaps not enough focus on World War I. The Allies will gain new heart and spirit in your company. I wish that I could shake the hand of each one of you and bid you Godspeed on your mission. This is the 82nd Airborne Division, fearless among fighting units. From Fort Bragg, home of the Airborne and the center of the military universe, this is the All-American Legacy Podcast, an inside look at the 100-year history of the 82nd. They are All-American all the way. Hello, All-Americans, All-American supporters, and All-American alumni. Welcome back to the All-American Legacy Podcast. I'm your host, Master Sergeant Patrick Malone. Thanks for returning for our second episode, First Contact. This year, we celebrate our centennial, 100 years of service for the 82nd. We're highlighting all of our major campaigns and many stories you've never heard. This week, we'll talk about the division's entry into World War I. But really, here we will discuss the background for and the lead-up into the division's baptism into the horrible crucible of warfare in the St. Mihail Offensive. St. Mihail is a real milestone, a landmark for this division, one that is often overlooked by our focus on World War II and the airborne capability. Course, attention, airborne, boat, rate, piss. Ten minutes. Tank equipment. Sound off for quick tank. Okay. 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 Okay, jump master. One minute. Get ready. Go. Here we go. Here we go. All the way. All the way. Gotta be. Gotta be. That's the Airborne Chant performed by the All-American Chorus. The All-American Chorus is one of only two choruses in our Army, and the only one in the continental United States. Cities, dignitaries, and senior military leaders all over the world request performances by the All-American Chorus. But the chorus would not even exist were it not for Major General Edmund Swift, the first 82nd Division commander. General Swift emphasized organizational singing and cadences during running and road marching, both of which he felt were critical to developing pride, cohesion, and discipline in his new unit back in 1917. If you've ever run on Ardennes Street between 0630 and 0730, you'll know that we continue the tradition of singing while running 100 years later. Now, I just want to say something here because I know many of you are asking, why are we talking about 100 years of service for the 82nd? After all, you are saying the division deactivated after World War I and was reactivated for World War II. Well, you're wrong. But we know that is a concern, but you'll just have to trust us for now. So, back to 1917. You know, when we think about our bloodline and our great legacy, there is so much focus on World War II and perhaps not enough focus on World War I. Lieutenant Colonel Joe Bacino, who currently serves as the unit historian for the division, explains. The idea of jumping out of an aircraft into active combat is a romantic notion, so much so that our airborne legacy really captures the imagination strongly enough to blanket our service in World War I. So, as you drive around Fort Bragg and walk in and out of our buildings, you find very little reference to World War I, but an enormous focus on World War II. And I always say that when you serve here, you walk among the ghosts of legends because we pay such great tribute to our airborne legends, and rightfully so. But we should not overlook the fact that we participated in the decisive moments of World War I. So it's important that we spend some time here on our first entry into combat. By the end of 1917, the 82nd Division was fully formed with two infantry brigades, one artillery brigade, and support units. Each brigade had two infantry regiments and one machine gun battalion. The field artillery brigade had three artillery regiments, equipped with 15mm howitzers 
and 75 mm howitzers, and a mortar battery. The division was completed by what was known as division troops, with 10 different support units. The division looks very different from today's brigade combat teams. Most of the units in World War I are gone today. There are, however, a few holdovers from 100 years ago. The 325th Infantry Regiment from the original 82nd Division is the current Falcon Brigade, 2nd Brigade of the 82nd Airborne Division. The heritage of the 319th Field Artillery, a part of General Swift's original division, is now represented by the 82nd Division Artillery. When you're on the deep of the so the war was on, the U.S. was in, and the brand new 82nd was committed. Now they had to get to the fight. On April 25, 1918, the division headquarters sailed from New York to Liverpool, England. The rest of the division followed. When they got there, the 325th Infantry Regiment participated in a parade reviewed by King George of the United Kingdom. In a letter to the troops in April 1918, King George said this, Soldiers of the United States, the people of the British Isles welcome you on your way to take your stand beside the armies of many nations, now fighting in the old world, the great battle for human freedom. The Allies will gain new heart and spirit in your company. I wish that I could shake the hand of each one of you and bid you Godspeed on your mission. The 82nd Division earned an incredible honor and lineage that day, and the fact that the 325th Infantry Regiment is still in the division is pretty cool. From England, the division went to France, where the All-Americans trained to enter the war. They saw their first action on the Marbeche sector of France in August of 1918. Now, the Marbeche sector had been considered a quiet or rest sector for most of the war, kind of a live and let live uh, philosophy during most of the war. But during August 1918, there was a, a marked increase in artillery fire and aerial attacks uh, from the Germans. So the sector got a little, uh, came a little active, more, m much more so active actually than it had been uh, previously during the war. That's Jonathan Casey, a historian and the archivist and Edward Jones Research Center manager at the National World War I Museum and Memorial in Kansas City, Missouri. Mr. Casey explains a forgotten piece of 82nd history from the Marbeche sector. There are two officers, Lieutenants Wallace and Williams, I don't have their first names. Wallace and Williams uh, went on a daylight reconnaissance with Corporal Slavin and Sullivan of L Company 325th Infantry, uh, and they did not return. Uh, when the POWs were exchanged later, after the armistice of November 11th, the POWs were exchanged, only Corporal Slavin was was found, was returned. Uh, the reconnaissance patrol had advanced through no man's land to the German wire, ambushed on their way back from that, and the rest of them were killed, and Corporal Slavin, the only survivor, became prisoner and then later was uh, returned after the armistice. This was the first known prisoner of war from our division. Meanwhile, the American Expeditionary Forces, the U.S. Armed Forces sent to Europe to help fight World War I, were planning for a big offensive in St. Mihiel, France. And that offensive, St. Mihiel, would be the All-Americans' baptism by fire. What do you know about the St. Mihiel Offensive and the 82nd Division in World War I? I have no idea, Sergeant. What do you know about the St. Mihiel Offensive and the 82nd Infantry Division in World War I? Absolutely nothing. Those are soldiers from the division and visitors to our museum here. They are, of course, aware of the All-American Division's role in Normandy, Holland, Sicily, and Salerno, but outside of hardcore history nerds like yours truly, no one really knows about the 82nd Division in St. Mihiel. This year, the 82nd Airborne Division turns 100. That's 100 consecutive years of service. Yet it's really only the last 75 years that are known. You see, we focus so much on our airborne legacy, on the airborne assaults during World War II, that we lose sight of everything that came before our airborne heritage. St. Mihiel came before our airborne heritage. St. Mihiel should be a milestone in our history. It was hugely important to World War I, and we were a real part of it. Yet even here in Fort Bragg, even in our home, 
it is largely forgotten. Well, we hope to change that with today's episode of the All-American Legacy Podcast. I am young. I am 20 years old. Yet I know nothing of life but despair, death, fear, and fatuous superficiality cast over an abyss of sorrow. I see how peoples are set against one another and in silence, unknowingly, foolishly, obediently, innocently, slay one another. That is a dramatic reading of a passage from All Quiet on the Western Front. Eric Maria Remarque's classic 1929 novel about fighting along the Western Front of World War I. Remarque fought on the war's Western Front and the brutality, the inhumanity, the horror he described as real. This vision of violence visited itself on the 82nd Division in St. Mihiel, France. St. Mihiel is the first real landmark in the history of the All-American Division, and in one of those odd twists of historic coincidence, St. Mihiel really fit the division's name. You see, this was the first offensive of World War I led by American soldiers. Up to this point, American forces had been in support of British and French commands. Pardon the obvious pun, but St. Mihiel was an all-American offensive. So, let's set the stage a little. General John J. Pershing, commander of the American Expeditionary Force during the Great War, felt that an attack into St. Mihiel, France could devastate the German forces and possibly allow for successful attacks into Germany. By this time, the 82nd was commanded by its third ever division commander, Major General William Power Burnham. During the early stages of the U.S. involvement in the war, generals held division command for very short periods, really a few months at a time. Major General Eben Swift, the first division commander, switched out after three months. Swift was replaced by Brigadier General James Irwin, who only held command for 22 days. Irwin was replaced by Major General William Power Burnham. Now, by September of 1918, the 82nd had the 22,000 soldiers required by a World War I division. What we lacked was experience. The late and truly great Roy Parker Jr., a patriot and noted historian widely recognized for his remarkable depth of knowledge about the 82nd, explained this problem in a piece he wrote in 1998. Here are his words, read by one of our paratroopers. Nearly half of the 15,000 soldiers in the division's four infantry regiments and four machine gun battalions were virtual newcomers to military service. Some had been drafted as late as March 1918, and had sailed for France with barely six weeks of training with the division. The problem could be traced to the previous march. Before then, the 82nd was a relatively cohesive gathering of draftees. These new minted soldiers learned together at Camp Gordon, Georgia, where the division was first organized in August 1917. Just as they ended their training cycle, however, the terrible manpower demands of the war intruded. More than 5,000 men of the division, mostly from infantry and machine gun units, were ordered away to seed units of newer divisions still in training. This lack of experience caused some of the division's leaders to worry about the impending fight in St. Mihiel. Nonetheless, the division is committed and, in France, the men continue to train for this fight. They study terrain and they practice attacking out of trenches trench warfare being the common World War I tactic. Then, on September 12, 1918, it starts. The 82nd is positioned in Vendier to start the fight. Here, the division's role is clear. Under the newly organized 1st Army, the 82nd holds the right flank during the offensive. And the first day of the offensive is a successful one. The division gets the best of most exchanges with the Germans. But then the Germans hunker down in defensive positions and combine artillery with machine gun fire. A savage, horrific battle follows. Our boys witness the kind of barbarity described by Remark in All Quiet on the Western Front. Our platoons and companies assemble attack formations. Our engineers cut gaps in the wire. 
the All-Americans are called to advance. Lieutenant Charles Harrison becomes the first All-American soldier killed in St. Mihiel. The division pushes on, committing units to attack onto the French town of Neroy. Then comes the third day of butchery. By this time, our men are worn down by these conditions. The fighting becomes more intense. On September 15, 1918, our C Company, 321st Machine Gun Battalion, advances under incredible fire to extend the right flank of another division, the 90th Division in Vendier. Here, the All-Americans are in a supporting role to the 90th. In a whirlwind of violence, more than 270 All-American soldiers from C Company are killed in less than five minutes. The fighting continues as the 82nd covers for the 90th. The American forces are by now really pushing the Germans back. The Germans are proving less organized than General Pershing anticipates. A big win for our guys appears possible. It is in this crucible that the All-American Division, now just over a year old, has its first hero. On September 15, 1918, Colonel Emery Pike is mortally wounded by an artillery shell while in placing a machine gun position in the face of withering enemy fire. Colonel Pike is the first 82nd soldier to receive the Congressional Medal of Honor. He is awarded the medal for his actions on September 15, 1918. The posthumous citation for the Medal of Honor tells the story. For gallantry and intrepidity above and beyond the call of duty in action with the enemy near Vendier, France on September 15, 1918, having gone forward to reconnoiter new machine gun positions, Colonel Pike offered his assistance in reorganizing advanced infantry units which had become badly disorganized during heavy artillery shelling. He succeeded in locating only about 20 men, but with these he advanced, and when later joined by several infantry platoons, rendered inestimable assistance in establishing outposts, encouraging all by his cheerfulness in spite of the extreme danger of the situation. When a shell wounded one of the men in the outpost, Colonel Pike immediately went to his aid and was himself severely wounded by a shell burst in the same place. While waiting to be brought to the rear, Colonel Pike continued his command, still retaining his jovial manner of encouragement, directing the reorganization until the position could be held. The entire operation was carried on under terrific bombardment, and the example of courageous devotion to duty, as set by Colonel Pike, established the highest standard of morale and confidence to all under his charge. The wounds he received were the cause of his death. Today, Pike Field on the 82nd Airborne Division portion of Fort Bragg memorializes Lieutenant Colonel Emerson Jennison Pike. Unfortunately, this field is the only tribute to our service in St. Mihiel on Fort Bragg. There are no streets, buildings, training areas here named for our participation in such a significant battle. This was really our initial entry into American combat lore, and it is largely ignored. The St. Mihiel Offensive ends on September 15th. The next day, thanks in part to the All-American Division, St. Mihiel and the surrounding areas are free of German occupation. The 82nd is relieved and goes into training for the next offensive. St. Mihiel was critical to the world. It allowed the Allied powers to shift to a new front and force the Germans to retreat. By October 1918, the defeat of the German forces was certain. World War I came to an end with the signing of the armistice on November 11, 1918. 137 soldiers from the 82nd were killed in St. Mihiel, and another 931 were wounded. This is a significant chunk, 10%, of the 1,329 All-American soldiers killed in the Great War. It's important that we don't overstate the role of the 82nd in St. Mihiel. After all, we were one of a total of 14 divisions and about a half million soldiers that fought in the offensive. Our 22,000 soldiers had a supporting role. But, we did hold the right flank, which is significant. St. Mihiel was the first D-Day. Our service within it should be remembered along with the more universally recognized D-Day, June 6, 1944.
Thanks for joining us here on the All-American Legacy Podcast. We hope you'll come back next week as we continue through World War I into the Battle of the Meuse-Argonne Forest and meet the division's second Medal of Honor recipient, Alvin C. York. Take a listen. Throughout our 100 years, Sergeant Alvin York has been our most prominent national hero. In fact, his story is in some ways bigger than the 82nd Airborne Division. The Germans met our charge across the valley with a regular sleet storm of bullets. I'm telling you, that there valley was a death trap. The Lost Battalion was surrounded for five days, and, and how they got in this position is another long fog of war story, but suffice to say that the Lost Battalion had no chance to fight their way out. That's next week on the All-American Legacy Podcast. Don't forget to share this with your friends, leave a rating and review, and let everyone know they can find the All-American Legacy Podcast here on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or wherever they get their podcasts from. From everyone here at the 82nd Airborne Division Public Affairs Office, we'll see you next time.